little bit about predatory lenders and alternative lenders, right? Kind of a, um, an interesting topic. So when I say predatory lenders and alternative lenders, what do you guys all think I'm talking about? Payday loans. Payday loans. Car title loans. Those types of things. Those are the things that we're going to go through. And here's what we're going to talk about. What are the types of loans? Because they all have similar characteristics, but they have different names. So sometimes you think, oh, this is not that kind of loan because it's a, it's a payday loan. Or it's not this kind of loan. It's a check cash loan. It's a pay advance, right? Well, they all have the same characteristics. And it's important to know that regardless of what they're called, as long as they do certain things, they have certain characteristics, that they're in this category, that get people in trouble. Then we're going to talk about who's targeted, because it turns out that specific people seem to be more susceptible to using these types of services and then getting in trouble than other groups of people. So who are these people? Are we among these people? And what can we do if we are? Um, what can you do if you're caught up in predatory lending? And what are your consumer rights? Um, what are those alternatives? And what are your resources if you feel like you're over your head? Okay. So the first thing I want you to do the, the thing that caused all the speaker, you know, angst and all this stuff here is I want to show you a video. Now, this video was created by a consumer advocacy group in California to teach their consumers about what predatory lending is and how it actually works, okay? So it's about five or six minutes, but I think it really gives you a good idea about what it is that, that occurs. She'll show you the ropes. Oh. Vicki, this is Mona, one of the five new employees we hired just this week. Why? Because business... Business is good. Hi, Mona. Hi. Just stick with me. I'll show you everything you need to know. Thanks, Vicki. Hi. My truck is going to cost $200 to get fixed, and that's $200 more than I have. Can you guys help? No problem, senor. Why don't we give you a payroll advance? Wow, that was fast. This really helps. Well, that's why we're the people you trust. We're only here to help. See you soon. So that's how it's done. Yeah, it seems like he was really happy with our service. <laughs> service, yeah. Service and a smile, that's all it takes, and then they're hooked. Hi. I'm still behind in my rent this month, and I only have $45 of the total that I owe you. Is that okay? Well, as you know, Mrs. Lau, we can't take partial payments, and we're not allowed to give you a new loan until you pay this one off. But I have good news for you. You can go next door to the other payday loan store, and they'll give you a new loan for the $250 that you borrowed from us. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Sure it does. That way you don't have to worry about your rent. Thanks again. Well, that was nice. You sure helped her. Yes and no. I mean... She's the one helping us. What do you mean? Look, it's all about making them a repeat customer. We want them to come back again and again. We sell loans. That's what we do. And well, we gotta sell them because they ain't great deals. That lady took out $250. It's two weeks later, and that amount is now due. She paid a fee of $45 when we gave her the money, but she couldn't pay off the whole loan. And legally, she's not allowed to get another loan from us to pay off the first one. So what are her options? Well, what people sometimes do is this. Today, she paid another payday loan company $45 to get the money to pay us back. And chances are, she still won't be able to come up with that additional $250 on top of all her other bills in the next two weeks. So then what is she going to do? I mean, so far she's paid $90 in just two weeks. Now you can call that helping her out, but I call it, well... Wow, how can you make something so bad sound so good? Well, first of all, you gotta play down this crazy APR. But you know, with a slogan and a nice smile, 
You too can sell anything, Mona. It's business. Vicky's right. Like most of our customers, it's not that hard to turn someone into a chronic borrower. I mean, that's where the profit is. That's where the business is. And business... Business is good. Hi, how can we help? Oh well, I'm back again. Mrs. Williams is one of our repeat... Trapped. Well, long-term customers. I just thought we'd have this paid off by now. But with my medical bills, I'm going to need another small loan. That's why we're here, Mrs. Williams. Thanks again. See you soon. How many times has she come in for that one loan? So eight and all. Oh boy, poor her. <laughs> poor her is right. Mrs. Williams borrowed $250 for her first loan, but she could never quite come up with the entire $250 to pay it all back. So every two weeks, when she gets her paycheck, and before she pays all her bills, she comes in and hands $250 to us. That way, her loan is officially paid in full. And then, since she really needs that money for bills, we turn around and give her back $250 as a new loan. And remember, each time she borrows that $250, she pays a $45 fee. That's her eighth loan from us. And if we add up 45 times eight, that's $360 in fees, just to borrow $250. And that's $360 in fees with not a penny going toward the $250 she owes us. So yeah, poor her, but rich us. Yes, but this is, I mean, it's not. It's not right, is it? I mean, what this really is, is it's it's business, Mona. It's our business. And business? Business is good. Loans are short-term, high-interest loans made to keep customers going back to the store paycheck after paycheck. They seem like a good idea during an emergency, but it can become extremely difficult to pay off these loans within the two weeks usually given. Did you learn things that, what things did you learn that you were not aware of? <clears throat> or what things surprised you? $45 eight times. She wants, she, all she was trying to do is pay off that $250, but she could never do it. $45 eight times, $360. So really, she's paid off that loan, but she hasn't legally paid that loan. So that's because she's not able to ask somebody to help her out to pay that and then without having to pay that, the interest or but just you know, that's only because they are not, they don't have the... She doesn't have the money. She's borrowed money that she's unable to pay back. So they'll say, it's, it, it's okay if you're not able to pay it back. You can get a new loan. You could go next door and get a new loan. 
That's one option. So you're in debt to a new payday lender, and then you're in debt to us. Or you could do something called a rollover fee, which means we'll let you extend the loan for a little bit, but it's going to cost you some money. It's going to cost you $45, right? So you should only, only be paying the monthly charge, but not the... So not the, the principal that she owes. Amount. Yeah, yeah. So she's just paying that monthly rollover fee, but she's never touching that. She is never touching that principal, and that principal is accruing interest. Mm. Yeah, so it, it, can you see how it can be a trap? You know, once you get in, it's really hard to get out, right? So here's some things to think about. So when we think about a predator, think about in the wild. What does a predator do? You know, you watch National Geographic. You've got the wild. Yeah, when, yeah they, they stalk in the night. They look for the people who are most vulnerable. And when that animal is at its most vulnerable, it's like, rah, right? And it attacks, and it pounces, and it, it, it incapacitates, and probably will kill it, right? That's what a predator is. Well, here's the thing. We have businesses who act in the very same way, and they're called predatory lenders. And we call them predatory lenders because they're ruthless, right? Like that, that animal in the forest, like the animal in the desert. And they, they're looking for people who are weak financially. They're looking for people who are vulnerable financially, and they're waiting to exploit their weaknesses, right? And so when they exploit their weaknesses, it, it, what does it do? It just makes that person a little bit more weak and a little bit more vulnerable. And so it's, it's a not, a good find, not a good situation to be in. Okay, so there are lots of names. Now, I drive through Salt Lake City. I take State Street here every day, right? And as I take State Street home, I like to take it because it's this, I can cruise. I like to cruise, right? And my, I look to the right and I look to the left. And I see stores, and the stores have different names. Um, they're, sometimes they're called check cashing companies. Have you seen something that says check cashing, right? Have you seen something, a pawn shop? Have you seen things that are like cash and go or fast cash or something like that? Those are all names for predatory lenders, okay? So, um, or you could also go online. Has anybody seen commercials inviting you to go online and get a loan? And all we need is your checking account. We can, you can have $10,000 in your checking account as soon as tomorrow, right? And so they're everywhere. They've got all sorts of names, but they all have the same characteristics, which are, here's, this is one type. It's called a cash advance. And this is generally true of all types of these uh, types of loans. So here it is. Usually you walk in. And what's going to happen is Danny's going to say, I need some cash. And I'm going to say, sure, Danny, no problem. Give me a blank check or give me your checking account information. And you're going to give me your checking account information, and I'm going to give you the cash, and you're going to sign an agreement that says you'll pay it back probably within 14 days. That's the usual time. And you'll also have to pay me interest. And usually interest is about 400%. That's the average amount uh, about the average amount of interest you can expect to pay on a loan, right? So there you go. Okay, so usually you have 14 days. But if you were short on money 14 days ago, what are the chances that you're going to have enough money 14 days later? Yeah. You're probably not. Probably not. If you're in mm -hmm. such a pickle that you have to go to a payday lender, you're probably not going to have that money 14 days later, right? So what are your options? Okay, your options are, well, I'm just not going to pay it. Well, they have your bank account number, so what are they going to do? They're going to go to your bank, and they're going to try and get those funds, and they're going to try and get those funds. And what happens if you don't have money in the bank to cover that amount of, of the loan? Then you get bounce check fees. You get bounce check fees. You get 20, 15 to $25 each time. And they're not going to say, oh, they got a bounce check fee once, so I'm not, I'm not going to do it again. No, every they're going to keep on doing it and doing it. So not only have you not paid them, but now your checking account has gone deeper and deeper into the red because they keep on submitting it, right? So that's one option. The other option, like that woman came in and she said, the rent's due, but I don't really have the money to pay, right? So I'm going to go next door to my friends at, you know, cash and go, and I'm going to get a loan from them to pay off my loan here, right? And now I owe these people money that I'm not going to have in 14 days. 
Or my third option is I'm going to come in and I'm going to say, I can't pay. And you're going to say, that's okay, Sheila. Just pay us $45 as a carryover fee. And the next week, you can pay us that. In 14 days, you can pay us that $250 U.L.S. Am I probably going to have $250 in 14 days? Probably not. Well, so that, that's a possibility, right? What if she pays the $45 plus $100 more? Wouldn't that help to go? Here's the thing about this type of payment. It's due payment. in full. So you can't use, it's very um, oh, rare to have. You can't just say, I've got $10. Can you take it? They want all their money up front. So if you can't pay all the money up front that they asked for, then you, you got it all over, right? You know, so you can't just say, I've got $25, I've got $50. You don't get that luxury usually with that kind of lender. And that's the difference. You, you know, with, when you buy a car, what do you do? You pay it over several months and several years. When you buy a house, what do you do? Do they say, you know, you owe $250,000 all up at front? No. You're able to make chunk payments that are reasonable for your budget, right? And so you, but with a payday lender, you usually have to pay the full amount right away, right? So that's where it's, it gets hard because maybe I have half the money, but they don't want half the money. They want all the money, right? And so that's where that's where it gets um, where we feel trapped. The other part um, maybe is a title loan. Have you guys ever heard of title <coughs> loans? Do you own your car? You can get up to twenty-five thousand dollars. All you need to have is a clean title loan. And it's along the lines of what we see with the cash advance. Instead of giving somebody a paycheck or your, um, your check, what are you giving them? Your title. And if you don't have $200 in today, you probably won't have $200 in two weeks. So what do they have? They have your title, which means they own your car, which means that your car could be what? Repossessed. And how are you going to get to work to make the money to pay off the loan? You, you're probably going to have to do some serious walking or some serious bus time, right? You know? And so, so I think this is, a, I don't know if I can say one's more dangerous than the other, but this one takes away something that helps me make the money to pay off the loan and helps me make money to feed my family and to put a roof over my head. So if I have to say one was worse than the other, I, I think that title loan is just a really, really bad idea. They're all bad ideas, but this is especially egregious, okay? So those are some types of loans that we see. These are the things that we think about most often when we think about predatory loans. Some other type of loans we, we need to be aware of. Um, what about pawn shops? What do you know about pawn shops? Has anybody ever pawned anything? I pawned something. This is what happened. I came in, I needed some, you know, I was trying to be, um, to liquidate so I could pay some bills. I took in these, these items and what the pawn person did is they looked at them and they appraised the value, okay? And they said, I'm gonna, you have two options. I can either pay you cash outright for these items and you could take that cash and go, or I can give you a loan for the value that I think these items are worth, okay? Mm -hmm. And you have, so these items are essentially your collateral, okay? And you can come back. It's usually about a 30-day period. And if you come back in 30 days and you pay me back, then you can have your items back. But if you don't come back in 30 days and pay me, guess what? They sell your stuff. Yeah, they sell your stuff. They get to keep all your stuff and they sell it and they make money, right? And so do you, at 30 days, you know, I can come back for my, my tools. I can come back for my bike, right? And sometimes, many times, we can't do it, so we end up losing our goods, okay? Sometimes you can go in and you can buy advances, like we talked about the rollover with the payday stores. Sometimes with pawn shops, you could also buy extensions, too. But what are you doing? You're buying time, but you're not paying down principal. You're not paying down that interest rate. But um, each pawn shop has their own um, way to do uh -huh. the loans, or that applies to all of them? Generally, that's how all pawn shops work. They're going to look at your items and they're going to assign a value. Now, that value is going to be very subjective based on who the owner of the pawn shop is and what kind of inventory they have. They might, they're probably going to lowball you. They're probably going to tell you that the guitar you paid $1,000 for is only worth, you know, $850 or something mm -hmm. like that because they need to make a profit, right? And then they'll give you those two options. You either walk away with the cash or you take the loan, right? But basically, they all use that same kind of operating procedure, generally. Mm -hmm. 
okay? So that's, that's another one. Um, rent to own. Who's ever done a rent to own? Right? Here's the great thing. I don't have, you know, you can pay it off in chunks. It's reasonable, right? To pay things off in small chunks. Here's the way it works, though. Okay? So I'm going to go to rent to own, right? You, do you see this? Okay, I want to buy an iPad because they're cool and they're fancy and I want to be just like my friends. But I don't have the money. I don't have $600 to drop right away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to rent to own and I'm going to make weekly payments. And they say how many payments and they say how many weeks you, that you must pay in, right? So if I pay $38 for 48 weeks, which is a standard, I looked this up at several rent to own places, it's about how much you pay for, for something of this. Um, and this is 400%, right? About, <laughs> well, you're paying, so look, you're paying, when it comes, $38 for 48 weeks is $1,872, right? Mm -hmm. So you're almost paying three times the amount, you know, a little bit. Um, a little more than three, three times. Three times, more. yeah, for what you could, if you just maybe would have saved. Sometimes we get really antsy, right? I've got to have it. All my friends have it. I need to have it, right? It's Sometimes we get confused with what our needs are versus what our wants are, right? And because I want something so badly, I'm willing to pay three times as much for it than if I just waited a little bit, right? Yeah. So it uh, reminds me of my question from last time. Mm -hmm. So it's because we don't have the habit of being able to save yeah. some money, and, but, but there's a good um, time where, okay, never mind. But we also need the credit. You so do. that won't apply to just Here's any a, kind of credit, just certain types we of. We need credit to make big purchases, to buy houses and things like that. So you have to think about what's the best way to get credit. And the thing about this, is that this kind of credit usually isn't put on the credit report that banks are looking at to give you a house. So they're not gonna see that you pay to rent to own 38 weeks and you're reliable. There are separate kinds of agencies that kind of monitor that amongst this group of lenders. So this is not the type of thing that's even gonna go on your credit when it's time for you to buy a house. Even so if you go good on your payments. Uh -huh, even if you go good, it's not gonna show up, right? And so you spent all this money, more than you had to, and you, you have excess payments, and it doesn't even go towards your good credit record. But on the contrary, if you don't pay, it'll affect It goes on your credit, oh, yeah, wow. absolutely. If you don't pay, it goes negatively on your credit, but if you do pay, it doesn't help you really very often, wow. right? Yeah, yeah. The oh, one thing um, that my, my boyfriend found out is some of these car places, that, you know, financing student and everything, it's the same thing mm -hmm. with them. You know, they, mm -hmm. they'll tell you, yes, this will go on your credit. It'll yeah. show when you pay your payments and everything. Well, he got a car and he paid it completely off and mm -hmm. then he went to get another car at another place and didn't show up. Didn't show up. He, and even wow. though he paid it in full yeah. and he was never looked. I'm going to tell you some things to look out for. So when you're evaluating, is this or is it not something that I should be involved in? There's some checklists of things that you want to, that you should be seeing. And if you see these things, these are kind of like red lights that say, stop, rethink these. And we're going to go through those. Um, some other things I want you to think about, you know, tax time is, it will be upon us before we know it, right? Mm -hmm. And do you see those commercials that say, come in, come in and we'll do your taxes and we'll give you your refund money right now. Even though, you know, you don't really get your refund from the government until March or April, we'll give you your tax return right now. That's called a refund anticipation loan. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the tax preparer does your taxes they make an estimate about how much they think you're going to get back as a refund, and they say, we'll give you this money right away. And then when you get your refund back, you just give your refund to us, right? And we'll call it good, right? And what happens is sometimes it turns out that you actually don't get back as much money as you anticipated. You had additional items that needed to, additional income that needed to be accounted for, and so you actually owe the government more than you thought. And so you get your refund, and your, your anticipation loan was for $1,000, but your actual refund was actually for $600. So what does that mean? $400. You owe them $400. Whoever gave you that loan, $400. Right? 
because you were kind of hedging your bets. Okay? I always thought that whoever did your taxes will actually know how much you're going to get. So, I always thought. You hope. You hope that somebody is. <laughs> you're saying it's an estimate. It's you an never... estimate. Because what happens is they, they fill out the paperwork and, they, and you send it to the IRS and then the IRS does their own checking. And they check for errors and they check for things that signal maybe that somebody didn't disclose all their income or, or a tax preparer made an error in the calculations. So what you're doing is you're sending your guests to the IRS and they're double checking it. And sometimes what they're going to find is your math was not right. And so you actually don't get as much money back as you think you are going to get. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to pay whoever it is who issued you that loan, you're, you're on the hook for the difference. Are those the same type of, they will deposit on your account? Is it the same thing? or No, so the IRS can't. Options. So when you receive your refund from the IRS, they'll either give you a check or a card or they'll deposit it into your into your bank account. I was thinking it was the same thing. No, it's a slightly over. different thing. It's okay. not the same thing as, so that's methods of payment from the IRS, <laughs> right? Okay. But regardless of how and what method they pay you, if you owe more to that lender, you're still going to have to pay additional to that lender. I have a question. So you consider this a predatory? Yeah. And you think, like, the one that I know that does that is H&R Block. Do you think H&R Block intentionally Gives you a high refund so that when it comes I, to you know what, I cannot say. And I don't want to disparage your business. I don't want to disparage a business because I want to say when I used to work for collections, they wanted you to not pay on time and get that overdraft fee. And they wanted you to do so. Does h and want to? You know what, I've used their services. I've been satisfied. I, I have not felt like I've been, you know, ripped off or, or cheated or anything like that. But h and is... They're not the only people on the block. You know, there are people who have small mom and pops, right? There are people who only do, who only operate during tax season, right? And so you got to make sure that you understand what you're getting into. It's all about it's all about having your eyes wide open to what you're getting into and could you handle the consequences, right? You know, um, so what can go wrong? I think we saw what can go wrong. So usually we're not able to pay back the loan because usually what happens is that a creditor wants the whole amount. So if you borrow $500, they usually want the whole amount, okay? There are some creditors who say, no, you can, you can maybe doll it up, but the interest rates are incredibly high. They're 400%, okay? That's the average, all right? This is not a very well regulated, uh, consumer-friendly type of industry, okay? And so the things that can happen, you get so many overdraft hits that the bank doesn't want you as a customer. So we're going to close your account. You are still in the negative. You owe us for all the times that that payday lender tried to access funds for you. And so not only do you owe the payday lender money, but you now owe the bank. You're negative $500 in the bank and your account's closed. Right? Okay? People who use payday lenders are at about 30% more likely to file bankruptcy. And the thing is, here's the thing. Go home and watch your TV. They say, don't file for bankruptcy. Just get a payday loan. Right? We'll help you through this rough time. Okay? <laughs> well, they're actually expediting this. The other thing is, because we're spending so much time trying to Rob Peter to pay Paul to make our, our payments that a lot of times that doesn't leave a lot of money left for food. That doesn't leave a lot of money left for gas. That doesn't leave a lot of money left for rent. Okay? And if our car's gone, then we don't have maybe the capability to earn income for food, rent, um, and those things. Right? Well, and if that's the case and you end up on the street because you can't make the payment on, the, on your rent, your car is being repossessed. And well, you just file for what, bankruptcy. You're probably in a situation. You end up on the street, but you have kids. And a lot of the things like that you? happen. Things like that happen. How are they going to get the money if you're not have a way to produce to, to work for that money to, to get and that? You know what? That's how we feel. But they're in a business to make money, and they have a different perspective, right? right. And you know what? They know their audience. They know who's most likely to use these services. Who is most likely to use these services? Any idea? Lower income. Lower income people. Okay. So people, and there's some specific people. People who do not have credit that is 
uh, good enough to open a bank account in a, because your bank checks your credit, right? So if your credit, if you have low credit to begin with because of circumstances, then you know you're less likely to be able to use traditional banking services. So where do you go, right? So people who are unbanked, okay? Remember that woman who said, you know, and my medical bills, right? People who have who are on disability type income, so social security disability or supplemental security disability, those are people who are likely to be susceptible. People who are on fixed income, okay, so those are people who are receiving disability income, those are people who maybe are senior citizens, okay, and we maybe have only social security and maybe a, a small pension, right? You know, sometimes we, there, there are some places where they target people who have brown skin, right? They make assumptions about don't trust the banks, right? Don't trust the man. Come to us. We're in your neighborhood. We're your people, right? You know? And so they, they, bank, they, they use that lack of trust that some, sometimes we can have if we're a member of different ethnic communities, and they use that as, as leverage to get us into the shop, right? So there are, lots, there are people who are very susceptible to this, right? Um, here's the thing. I want you to know, first of all, if you are involved, if you are involved, okay, and you're over your head, there's some things that you need to know about how somebody can approach you about your debt. How many of you, you've been a debt collector before, Jen, right? Okay? And so, um, and you just have a smiley face. I get the feeling that you weren't necessarily, you know, I'm going to send you to jail in the middle of the night, right? I hope not. But there are some things that collectors can do, but there are some things that they cannot do when they're trying to collect on the loan, okay? So some of the things, they cannot lie to you. So they cannot say that you owe more money than you do, all right? They cannot say that you've committed a crime. Is being in debt a crime? Really, it's not a crime. So they can't make any implications of, you know, We'd hate to have you go to jail over this. There's not really anything such a thing as a debtor's prison anymore. And sometimes people will call and they'll say, we'd hate to have to send the sheriff out to take you to jail. We need you to make a payment today. If you hear that, what do you know? You know it's baloney. You know that they cannot say that. And you need to say, that's a lie. You cannot say that. Okay? Um, some other things. Debt collectors must identify themselves to you on the phone. <coughs> they can't call up and say, hi, how you doing, have a chat. They cannot represent themselves as anything other than what they are, right? So I have to say, this is Sheila calling from Swift Collection Services about such and such. Okay, I've got to identify myself. Debt collectors must stop contacting you if you ask them to do so in writing. So if you're tired of the harassment, you can send a debt collector a letter and say, do not contact me, do not send me an email, do not send a letter to my house, do not contact me. Now, does this mean that your debt goes away? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind, but it's not out of sight, gone away, right? So you can ask people to stop harassing you, but that doesn't mean that you are... Um, you are released from your debt, and that's an important thing to know. Some debt collector feedback. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, there was departments, and they called them buckets where I used to work. Mm -hmm. um, the furthest one was bucket six, which is the last bucket before the soldier count off. Mm -hmm. um, and they had the ability, they weren't on the phone the whole time. Their main job, I was bucket one, I was call after call after call, but main job on bucket six is they will investigate your social security number, they'll find out from your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, and they will call all of them until they get a contact number for you. And they will call them every day. They'll be telling you. Unless you tell them to quit calling. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But they will investigate, especially if you put them as yeah. a reference, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they will try to find out all the information that they can around you. So that's what one of the departments was where I used to work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pernicious. You know what pernicious means? It just means it's kind of, it's persistent in a negative way, mm -hmm. right? When somebody, when they, doctors talk about somebody has a pernicious di a disease. A disease is a bad thing, and pernicious means it just, it won't cure itself, you know? No matter what we do, it doesn't go away. It just stays, and sometimes it gets worse. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what, the, you know, pernicious debt collectors. They don't go away. It just, you know, it seems to compound, right? Um, some other things. So, 
Go ahead. Maybe yeah. Maybe it's more like, I just want to know, know more of the topic. But, um, so if they are harassing the people to the point where they might really um, stress about it, how is that helping them to get the money? You know what? In the uh, I mean, to have, does it work to stress people out in what, in what way? You know what? In the long in our mind, we think, well, you know, you you get more. There's a saying that you get more you get more flies with honey than with vinegar, which means if you're nicer to people, you generally get what you want. Mm. You know, you usually more often than if you're mean to people, right? That usually is the scenario. But here's the thing: they're in a business, and they know that they're going to get their money regardless. They're going to harass you mm. till you give them their money, or they're going to harass you until they're in bucket six and they're going to sell their debt off to somebody else. And they have to pay bucket six to do that. Bucket and six is, is going to pay them. Bucket six. So at, at some oh. point, uh, there's there are people who make their money by taking debts off of other people's hands and then collecting the, that payment for themselves. So either way, they're going to get their money. So they don't have to be nice because either you're going to pay me and I'm going to harass you to pay me, or eventually it's going to get so bad that I'm going to sell your debt to another company. So they're going to pay me what you owe, and then they're going to then go on and harass you until they get their money, and then maybe that company will sell off their debt, so they'll recoup their money, but you're still on the hook for the for the for what you owe. So either way, in that business loop, somebody will eventually get paid and you'll still have to be on the hook. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it is ruthless. Mm -hmm. It is ruthless, right? So people usually use predatory lenders because what? I don't feel like I have any other alternatives. Isn't that right? If you had another alternative, yeah. wouldn't you go and use it? And here's the thing. Sometimes we don't think about the obvious alternatives that are out there, okay? And so let me talk to you about that. So. Find another source for funds, you know? I wouldn't take a pawn loan, but if I had extra stuff that I didn't need, I might pawn it. And I might put it on KSL, or I might have a garage sale, right? I might find other ways to get my to get that money. Okay? So are there other ways that we can that we can reasonably and legally acquire the money that we need for whatever resource? That's what I was referring to to the bottom of my, uh, from friends and family. Is because that's the only uh, way they can have the money from, or because they don't have any other uh, well, other ways to go in. They, they don't have friends or family, and you know, think of someone that comes from another country a lot of times, right? And there's no family here, yeah. just them. And then they have no one to turn to. And they don't know the system. Right. right? Yeah. And they, and they trust. They trust, they trust that, uh -huh. that it's going to be. They're different. You come to a, a, that's exactly right. You come to a, here from a country that is, could be very different from your own as far as cultures and mm -hmm. values. And there are some countries that don't, and some cultures that don't believe in paying interest. You come, you get the money, you pay it back when you can, and you know, and you kind of pay it forward. And so if you have that kind of mentality and somebody pretends to be your friend so they can go in for the kill, mm -hmm. it makes it really easy. Sometimes we don't have friends or family. Sometimes we have tapped out our friends and family. And our friends and family cannot help us or they won't help us, right? You know? And so for whatever reason, all your available resources have dried up. That's usually when we go to the, to, into those places, right? Um, some other things. Check with credit unions, and I specifically mention credit unions because credit, many credit unions are part of an initiative um, to help people who are in this credit, who are in uh, the credit doghouse, for lack of a better uh, terminology. You know, I've had a bad credit history, I haven't been reliable, but I'm working on being reliable, and so a lot of credit unions have um, programs, a lot of credit unions around the company, country have programs where they're going to give you a loan. It's going to be a higher interest rate, but it's not going to be that 400% interest rate. It probably won't be above 36%, right? You know? And not every credit union has it, but what you want to do is you want to ask your credit union, you know, I'm in this situation, is there a product that you have for me? Right? You would be surprised. Okay? And, and that's something that, that National Credit Union Association has kind of promoted. I don't see that much with, you know, with banks, right? I, I did some research before I came to see if there's a, a bank corporation alternative. There doesn't seem to be, okay? Um, borrow from family and friends if you can, because the likelihood that you're somebody's going to say, 
yeah, I'll give you $50 and you better pay me back with 400% interest, it's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to get your best interest rate with family and friends, okay? Um, working with your creditors. You know, you have a bill that you can't pay, and so you think, I've got to pay this bill, so I've got to go to this payday lender, I've got to go get a title loan to pay. Call up your creditor and say, I can't pay this month. And options will be presented to you. Options, you know, if this is a first time thing, it might be we're going to extend you 15 to 30 days. Which is the $45 a month we saw in the beat. So this is different. So this is if you have, <laughs> let's say, I ha so this is if, let's say I have a credit card bill that I cannot oh, pay. Sorry. I or I have a mortgage payment that I cannot pay, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of going to a payday lender to get that money, call those com call your banking institution and tell them that you are having difficulty. And they will tell you, you can be extended 15 to 30 days. Um, or they'll tell you, you know, can you make a partial payment? And then can you make several other small partial payments? And maybe there'll be a fee, but it's not the same fee that you pay <coughs> when you get a, a, a payday lending type of um, a loan, okay? Mm -hmm. So call them up, be honest, I can't pay this month. I'm having a hard time, right? Some can even lower your yeah. interest rate sometimes uh -huh. if you ask them. You know, and the, some will lower your credit rate, and that's the thing about working with a credit counseling agency is that they help you to negotiate those things, right? But even your cre your interest rate, you can mm -hmm. sometimes have them lower. Yeah, and but you can't do that if you know you can't just do it telepathically. You no, have to communicate have to with them, them. Mm -hmm. and you have to let them know what's going on, right? And they'll say, okay. We're going to do this for you, and this is the arrangement we've come to you. Now, if you don't meet that arrangement, then, you know, we're back to square one, but they're going to be reasonable. They're going to be much more reasonable than if you went to somebody, to a payday lender, and then tried to repay that kind of loan. Yeah. yeah. Um, some other things. You know what? Use a credit card. And um, credit cards are high interest rate. What is your credit card interest rate, generally? <coughs> Tw anywhere from 12 to 24 percent interest, right? So is that a high interest rate? It is a high interest rate. 375 percent interest is a higher interest rate than that, though. The other thing about using credit card now, not these are not the ideal options. The ideal option is I have perfect credit, I have enough savings, I can buy the things that I need. But sometimes when we're in those situations, right, it's better to use a credit card which has a significantly lower interest rate, you can pay it off in small chunks, right? And if you only have the minimum, the minimum will do, it'll take you longer to pay it off, but you know, you're not in such a chokehold, right? The other thing you might want to, you might find yourself falling back on is your overdraft from your bank. Do you know what I mean when I say overdraft? So I have a, I signed up for my bank and when I opened my checking account, what they told me is that Say you have somebody, you write a check to somebody and it turns out you don't have enough money to cover it. Well, we will cover it for you and you'll owe us that money plus for my bank it's $15. So if I wrote somebody a check for $100 and I didn't have $100 in the bank, the bank would cover it and I'd owe them that $100 back plus $15. So I don't want them $115, right? And that's a lot less than the interest rates that we're paying. And we're not paying continual rollover fees, right? And so sometimes we need to use our overdraft. It is not the ideal situation, but sometimes we know that that is the lesser of the evils. You know, when you're thinking about, you know, bet good, better, best, horrible, you know, those types of things. And you move on the scale, you know, it's not, it's not that... Um, where we have payday lenders is kind of the worst, and perfect credit and banking being the best. It's kind of we're moving along the spectrum here. Um, some other things we talked we talked about financial counseling several times today, right? Getting help, going to somebody who's a fine. So people who give you financial counseling. So when you go to credit counseling, you're going to see somebody who's not necessarily just you know a volunteer who's interested in helping you out. This is somebody who is trained. Okay, somebody who is trained in helping people figure out reasonable budgets. Helping people who have no money figure out reasonable budgets. Helping people who owe bills figure out reasonable budgets. Helping people figure out what their rights are, what they can ask for and what they should ask for. Okay, 
These are people who are going to help get you on track. Will you be able to pay all your bills right away? Probably not, okay? But you'll have a road that you can walk on where if you follow the map, soon things fall into place and it seems a little bit more manageable. Um, the other thing is, do we build an emergency fund? Right? How do we build an emergency fund? Save a little at a time. A little at a time, that's the thing. Let's talk about the things that you, that you bought today. Did anybody buy coffee today? No? Did anybody go to, did I go early in the morning to Holiday Oil and I get my, my 68,000 ounce thing of Coca-Cola, right? You know, it's as big as my face, okay? Did anybody eat out for lunch today? Right? You guys are so good. We have money. Does anybody have money? You know, we, we have money, but we don't know that we have money. When I think about things, you know, I think about, okay, that, that, that incredibly large container of Diet Coke I have, that's like, that's like $3 a week. What if I drink water and I put that $3 a week in a can? I would probably be healthier, healthier, I'd have lower blood sugar, I would weigh less, and I would have $3 a week that I put in that little can. What about my Netflix, right? You know, I gotta have Netflix, okay? I gotta, you know, well, what happens if instead of having that seven to eleven dollars a month for Netflix, I went to the library and got DVDs? Mm -hmm. Oh, perish the thought, you know, that I have to watch a DVD. Or maybe, you know, if you want digital movies, maybe I watch movies on my computer using. The, and using the library's digital movie service, right? Do you like that? No, I yeah. love that. Thank Here's you. Here's the thing. We, have, <laughs> we, we always say, I don't have enough money. And it turns out that, you know, we build it little by little. And it turns out that, that we take a little bit here. I'm not going to get my Coke this week. I'm going to give up. I'm going to give up. And sometimes I, sometimes I can't bring myself to say, oh, I'm giving up Netflix. So I say, I'm just going to give it up for a month, right? And then by the time that month comes around, I hardly miss it. I was like, oh, Netflix, right? I used to have that, but now I use, you know, now I use Hoopla with the library, right? And so those little things add up. So you don't have to say, you know, I've got to mortgage my first child or something like that to start an emergency fund. You just put little chunks all the time, and slowly those chunks add up to something substantial. Okay? So even when you're in the midst of this, think about those little chunks that you could do. Do I need to go to Holiday Oil? Do I need to go to Starbucks today? How many times do I need to go down to the vending machine? Take that money that you would have spent and put it in. Drink water. Go to the library. You know, think about those things. And it's hard. And you know what? You won't have to do it forever. You can eventually go back to those things, right? But you do it now. You do it now to, to regain control. Um, some other things I want you to think about, about your consumer rights. Debt collectors may only contact you between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. So if you're getting calls at 9.30, you're getting tells at 10 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock in the morning, that's a no-go. And say that. You may only call me between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Okay? Uh, according to the Federal Trade Commission. The law, right? Some other things. Debt collectors may not contact you at work if they know your employee disapproves of the phone calls. So, because sometimes we put down where we work as part of a, a reference in the initial uh, application for credit, right? And then your, the creditor has that telephone number. You say no, they can't do it. They can't call you at work. They should not call you at work. It's against the law. Now, if they do call you at work, we'll talk about what you're going to do. If they do violate any of these things, we're going to talk about what you should do. Um, debt collectors may harass, oppress, or abuse you. <coughs> So they cannot say, you little cow, you better pay your money. <laughs> they cannot say, you know, I'd hate to see your legs broken, right? You know, this is not, you know, this is not the Sopranos version of collective debt, right? That's not, that's not kosher, okay? Um, some other things. We talked about who's at risk, elderly, ethnic minorities, people of poor history. Some things I want you to know if you are living, if you are an active military person or if you are in contact with somebody who's an active military personnel and they are involved in, in um, predatory lending. Because it turns out that also military people, especially enlisted personnel, can also fall into this trap. Because you know what? 
they're not making big bucks, are they? No, it's a hard life too, right? And especially if I'm deployed and you're at home and we have to work together to make finances work and there's a lot of stresses that happen. So here's the thing. So when somebody attempts to get a loan, no matter what type of loan it is, if they disclose that they're an active military personnel, the interest rate cannot exceed 36%. 36% is the magic number. If anybody offers you a loan, just generally, that's more than 36% interest, you know that you're getting into the predatory loan category. You're moving out of a legitimate um, banking procedure and you're getting into people who want to take advantage of your, of your lack of credit. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Well, yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, they have to include all the fees, so all the all the um, initiation fees, maybe if there is a credit check or anything, all of this has to be included in that 30%. It's all rolled up into that 36% rate. Um, also, usually when you go to a credit um, payday loan, they'll say, you know what, if something ever goes wrong, if you're unhappy with us, don't sue us. You have to arbitrate. Do you know what arbitration means? It, it just means that, you know, instead of going to court, we're going to sit down with a third party, and a third party is going to help us resolve it. And why do they want you to do that? It could be their people, right? And legal fees are expensive, right? And so they don't even want to go there. So we're going to force you into this less desirable option for you, right? They can't do that if you're an active military personnel. They cannot mandate that you that you go into arbitration. If you're not happy and you want to take legal action, you are right to take legal action. That's within your right. The other thing that if you're a military personnel, if it, you cannot ask for a check account or a bank account to obtain a loan. So they can't say, we'll give you this money and you give us your bank account because we're going to you know, try and access your bank account in two weeks. That's a no-go. Right? So it makes it really... Um, Payday lenders are, are not really, um, aren't really targeting military personnel anymore. Because guess what? It's not, there's nothing inviting about working with somebody who's in the military anymore. I can't charge them interest. I can't, you know, ding their, their checking account every week. I can't make them arbitrate with me. I can't do any of the things that I can normally do to make my money because, you know, laws have been set up. Because, especially, think about it, you're deployed and somebody's digging your checking account and you're trying to call from Iraq to, you know, Salt Lake City. That, you know, that is not um, international best interest, I think, right? <laughs> and so that's why they probably have those laws. Go ahead. Yeah, I was like, just because of uh, the military, um, because you are active in the military. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when they call you, they need to speak to the person mm -hmm. who and if you're deployed, right, you can't necessarily be a good advocate for yourself. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's why they have these rules. Um, some other things. How do you know if something is a predatory loan or if it's, if it's just a high interest rate loan that you're getting into? So we talked about 30, 36% interest is kind of the threshold that you look at. If you're paying more than 30, you could pay very high interest and get it from a bank and they understand that you're a credit risk so they're going to charge you a high uh, interest rate but if you're paying more than that then it's going to get predatory okay then you know you're getting into that field um, anytime a borrower says give me a post dated check or give me your checking account number so I can ask and your routing number right anytime they're asking for access to your banking accounts then you know that something's fishy some other things. If you have to turn over your car title, I can't give you the money unless you give me your car title. Unless you give it to me and hold it, I can hold it in my possession. Okay? Then it gets fishy. Um, repayment is due in a single balloon payment. So it's all due at once and it's all due within 15 to 30 days. Okay? If they say you gotta pay me back $1,000 in 14 days, then you know that something's not gonna, it's not gonna work out for you. And if somebody is aggressive, when they call you and say your loan's due, I hate to have you go to jail, right? Usually people in credit card companies don't say I hate to have you go to jail, right? It's usually when we have people who have, have high, high interest rates that are, are giving you these, giving you kind of the pressure, right? 
So as you go through, and you know what? This happens, the reason why I want you to look at these things is because sometimes there are some banks who will charge you a loan that's in excess of 36%. And you think, but I went to a bank, right? I went to a bank, so it's got to be on the up and up. Banks sometimes engage in predatory lending. And there's a whole lot of legislation that's trying to happen in Utah about, did anybody read the Salt Lake Tribune over the weekend? There was a report about how many people use these types of loans that we've talked about and what their percentage of their payback rate is, how many people are able to pay it back within the first 30 days. And it's not a very high amount, right? And they talked about how many people how many times somebody actually has to roll over, meaning pay that $45 each time before they're actually able to pay back their loan? How much time do you think that is? Any idea <coughs> how much How many rollovers they have to do before they're able to pay their actual loan from a payday lender? Six times. Six times, right? So if you've got a $50 fee each time, what's that? That's $300. Right, in addition to the $500 that you already owe. So you're $200 short of $1,000 that you owe to somebody or that you paid to somebody when the experience is over. Right? So it's when they get their extra check for <laughs> When they have three paychecks <laughs> instead of two in a month. Uh huh. Yeah, and they're like, it's oh, this like is every it. Six months. That's, yeah, yeah, that's probably it if you're paid every uh -huh. other week, right? You're waiting for that. You know, November is a, is a fifth month paycheck day. It's a fifth month paycheck, right? And I, I think probably anybody who's paid twice a month knows when you get your, your, your uh, three paychecks in a month type of thing. Paid every, week, every other mm -hmm. week, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, here are some things, here are some places that I want you to go to if you are in this kind of scenario, okay? The first thing is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. What you can do is you can say, somebody's calling me and they're harassing me, or somebody has, um, I've taken out this loan and I'm being either harassed or I can't pay it back. Or maybe they did the bait and switch, right? So you thought you were getting one thing and you're getting another thing. So for whatever reason, you if you feel like you're over your head, go to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Has anybody ever heard of this? It's a, I don't know if it's a, it's a fairly new government agency, but what does it sound like? Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Well, they're uh, focused on helping the, the, cons uh, the consumer. consumer. Yeah, yeah, the focus is on helping the consumer. So guess what? So that we don't have another recession, so that because people aren't using subprime loans, right? People aren't taking borrowing more than they, they have in the bank, right? We don't ever want that to happen. And again, so it's in our government's best interest to make sure we're looking out for your best interest, right? Uh, some other things. The Attorney General of Utah. Right? That's the law. Some other things, the National Cred Foundation for Credit Counseling, that's the thing that I talked to you about. That's going to tell you who in our area has been certified to help you figure out your credit issues, figure out your budgeting issues. And you want to make sure that you get with somebody who's aligned with this organization, because this is kind of an <laughs> ethical body. These are the people who, if you find a, a um, credit counselor through this body, they are trained. Um, they have current education. They probably have licensures of different kinds, right? So they are experts in the field, okay? So don't just go to somebody, you know, that your, your cousin knows. Make sure that you check them out through the, through the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, okay? All right, so last time I talked way too much, right? And there wasn't enough time to get any business. And so I cut down my sites to the essentials. Now I'm ready to answer any questions that you have about this, about what we talked about. Go ahead. My only issue is when I got divorced, I went to uh, a consumer, I forget what it was, mm -hmm. consumer, consumer credit counseling. Mm -hmm. And I found out they weren't paying up all my money. And, and if I would have known, because I wanted to be a good person and pay all my debt mm -hmm. back, it would have been better for me just to file bankruptcy because when you use a counseling service, they try to get your lower in payments lower to pay it back, but then it dings your credit. So yeah, you need to go in with your eyes open. A couple things about about credit counseling. There are credit counselors 
person will just go in and help you put your financial house in order and figure out which bills are the most important to take, knowing that your credit's bad and maybe you're going to take a few more things before you get better. They help you kind of triage your situation, okay? Then there are companies that say, we're a credit counselor, and what we're going to do is we're going to give you, you're going to pay all your money to us that you owe to the creditors, and then we're going to distribute it. And then after a certain period of time, if you've made all these, these payments, then we're going to give you a loan for the rest of your money, so we're going to clear you out with your creditors, and then you're only going to owe us, right? And I don't know um, that that's um, an ideal situation either, because what they're doing is they're distributing the money for you. And sometimes they're not distributing it in a timely manner, right? Quite honestly, okay? So when you see those companies that say, we're a debt consult, we're a credit counseling debt consolidation company, give it some pause, okay? You want to find out when are they paying the bills? Are they being are you being charged a fee for having them do this service for you? Right? And so you want to be aware of those types of things, okay? Because that's two different things. Helping you triage and helping you make decisions is different than somebody taking control of your finances for you, right? And if you fail to make one payment, then you're out on your butt and you have to start all over again with somebody else, right? And so I, to me, that's not the option that I would go with. I'd go with the person who would just sit down with me and say, here are the things that are most important that you should be thinking of now to help you you know, breathe, and then here are the other things that you should be thinking of, and then here are some higher level things when we, once we get things taken care of versus somebody that just says, you know, I'll just pay your bills for you. I'll just be your money manager. Yeah, yeah. which is why would you want to do that when you can be in control of your own money? And Never let anyone else you know control what? your and money. So the attitude is... They work with credit card uh -huh. companies they do to get work your lower them. interest rates lowered, uh -huh. and some, some but credit it's very cards, possible because you they have a good repertoire, uh -huh. sometimes credit companies will... Yep, Just and the other thing that you talked about them. is when you negotiate a lower credit rate, a lower interest rate through the credit companies, what it shows on your credit report is that you have paid, but it's not as agreed, right? With, as agreed is what you want. You want you want double A credit as agreed. It means that here were the terms that were originally set out, and you met all the terms. When it's not as agreed, I can't remember what the designation is, but it just says that you had to modify in order to pay that loan. And that thing's your credit too, right? So um, if you go through those types of services, you're not always in charge of your money. And because you made a settlement agreement, that dings your credit as well. Not as bad as if you just didn't pay, but you're going to have some implications as well. Oh, no, I wish I would have filed bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. And some, you know, and I think Shauna's going to talk about that. Sometimes bankruptcy is the option, right? Mm -hmm. It's not It's not fun. Has anybody filed for bankruptcy? It is, it's not the thing that you want to have happen, but sometimes it is the right choice. Just another comment in mm -hmm. my past experience where I used to work. Um, <laughs> We would call people and they would say that they've been through a counseling credit service and so we would have to automatically stop calling them because we have to deal with their counseling. And the counseling wouldn't pay until it was in bucket form, with usually four months into debt with no payment because they were looking for a settlement. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you just want to be, when you go into somebody and they're offering to work with creditors to pay your bills and offering to pay your bills on their, when they're offering to pay your bills on your behalf, Ask questions. When? How much money is this really costing me? What is it going to look like to my, for my credit? Should have this long time. You know what? That's the thing. <laughs> you know, I would have done a lot of different things had I had come to this financial knowledge beforehand. But you know how I learned it? I learned it in the school of hard knocks, right? Yes. And now that I've learned it, I'm not going to do it again. That's the thing. So hopefully this gives you enough knowledge and we can learn from each other's experience and from the information here that we know what's you know. No, this is personal. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the first time I came in last week, I wanted to take out a, uh, what do you call it, sorry, I went blank for a minute. Painting one? No, the credit card for, um, for medical or cosmetic, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hair credit. Yep. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. I went blank for a minute. <laughs> I was going to apply for hair credit because I am in the process of getting LASIK surgery mm -hmm. for my eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's my biggest loan I've ever had. <laughs> And um, the total amount that I'm going to have to do pay the day of surgery is $3,700. Care oh. Credit approved me for $5,500. So I was originally thinking about putting it down 
of 1000 and then doing the rest in payments. But I had a friend <laughs> who she used to work for Lexington Law mm -hmm. and she used to repair people's credit. She's like, no, do it all on the card. She's like, do it on the card because then it'll show that you can pay big amounts. She's like, let it report to the credit bill and then in the month put the thousand dollars down and then do the monthly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So is that correct? If I make out the whole big amount instead of putting it down first? You know what? I don't know the answer to that specifically, but here's the thing. Here are the questions you can ask. Is the, cr is the interest rate reasonable? It's no interest for two years. It's no interest for two years. Oh, yeah, can you make the payments? Right. Yes. Can, okay, what's yeah. going to happen if you lose your job? Will you be able to make the payments? Are you going to, you know, are you... Well, where my question was is that I wanted to keep it under the 30% that I don't want to go. Okay. I didn't get the, the 30%. Is it, so is it 30% of your total income? Is the loan more than 30% of your total yearly income? Um, it, well, the, the total amount, but I'm not using the total amount. I don't really okay, so the amount you're taking out is less than 30% of your income. It's about 30. It's about 30, so you write in the threshold. So are your monthly payments, so you get paid, you have a paycheck every month, and you're going to owe money to this credit card company. Is that monthly payment going to be more than 10% of your monthly income? It's about 10%. It's okay, so you're right on the threshold mm -hmm. here of it being suitable, right? Because 30% of your income um, and 10% of your, 30% of your total income and 10%, um, 30% of your yearly income and 10% of your monthly income is what we're looking at. Well, my thought was just that if I put the down first, and it wouldn't apply to the credit card, or do I put it after all the credit cards are already charged and then paid off the credit card? You, you know what well, I'm Well, because it's zero percent mm -hmm. interest rate, you could do that. I mean, I'd even I just have, if you could if you're disciplined opinion. enough to even have it in the mm -hmm. bank, and then just make, you know, what I do when it's like that interest for so long, mm -hmm. I divided what the amount should be per month. And then you can double that so that you're still paying it off. Well, that's why I would want to pay it off quickly because yeah. I don't want to. Here's the thing. Or you just want to ask. It's not saving money. It sounds like you're right on the threshold mm -hmm. of, of having um, a debt that's manageable, right? My, my personal op philosophy is if I have cash, pay cash. Right. If I have that, I'm not good. And I've thought about that. Oh, I should use my credit card, and then I'll pay off because it'll build my credit. Usually, what happens if I have cash and I go that way, then something comes up. I need a new tire. Right. It turns out there's a little leak in my roof. And so what I was I was gonna pay that thousand dollars, you know, eventually. But those little things came up that ate at it, and now you know. Yeah, you know, that money that I had that I was going to pay my credit card and that plan that I've worked out, it usually doesn't work out in the way that I anticipate it. So my opinion is if you have cash to pay it down now, take that cash, pay it down. Well, the out. reason I, because I'm actually the contrary. I'm so scared of debt, and it's probably because that was one of my first jobs. <laughs> I'm extremely scared of debt. So I want to ease into it slowly before I find that I'm in the hole. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's that's where my questions are coming from. Like I don't want to be in the hole. Well, if you get the credit and then pay the thousand, it well, you zero because it's zero percent interest. That's the thing. Have them all pay. <laughs> you know what? It's up to you. It really is. I think you know the thing that you always just want to make sure of is do do I have the capacity to meet my obligation and even to deal with surprises. Yeah, and to deal with surprises, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and if I have the capacity to meet my obligations, if I'm reasonably able to, you know, hand, you know, do I, is there a little cushion available, the old crap fund, do I have an oops fund, right? If I feel like I'm reasonably able to manage the debt, mm -hmm. then you use the credit. But if you feel like, I don't know, my job's kind of shaky, I don't know if I'm going to have the same mm -hmm. income that I've always had, then... I'm probably going to say take a more cash-oriented route, right? So more that's my answer you you. Get your Thank cash you. That is my <laughs> answer. It's all about assessing your risk. Is if you need to talk to a lawyer, who has money to talk to a lawyer? I don't always have money to talk to a lawyer. One thing we recognize um, or we recommend is the Tuesday night bar. Have you all ever heard of that? Through the University of Utah, right? People who give their, lawyers who give their time pro bono will give you 
good, sound legal advice, right? The other thing we recommend, um, credit counseling services. If you go to the National Credit Counseling Foundation, they will give you a list of credit counselors in our area. One that's really popular where we live is the AAA Credit Foundation. And we were talking to a couple people about that after class. And you know what credit counseling does? Has anybody gone through credit counseling? Are you familiar? So what is it all about? I'm just barely going through it right now. Okay. So, um, well, I sat down with a gentleman. Um, I, I went into a, a place up on 7th East mm -hmm. um, to inquire about buying a home. Mm -hmm. I've never done that and what I need to do. And they, they hooked me up with a gentleman who works in their office mm -hmm. that does credit repair. Yeah. And so he sat me down and he went through, pulled up my credit, went through everything that was on there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he gave me... Uh, websites to go on so that I can dispute what's on there. Mm -hmm. um, I just recently got my letters from the three credit bureaus and I'm going to send those out mm -hmm. so that they can start disputing everything that's on there and they either have to within 30 days. So what you're doing for your bank is your bank is giving you an opportunity if there are any errors on your credit to, to take care of those because errors can ding your credit score for the worst, right? And that happens. People have similar names, people have shared addresses, things along that line. So it gives you a chance to do that. One of the things I learned too is even though I have some things that were paid off, it's on there as a negative. So it shows it was paid in 2009, but it's on there as it's negative towards me. Yeah, it is. is and it'll show, and sometimes it has to do with when you paid and how many days between payments and things like that. So one of the things a credit counselor will do, they'll help you if you need help navigating and understanding your credit report. They'll also help you figure out a budget. They'll also figure out how to help you pay your bills and which in which order. You know, if you're un, if you are overwhelmed, this is a really good place to start. Okay? So I wanted to give you those resources before we got started. So today we're going to talk about Go ahead. Write those two down on the board. Yeah, I will. Would you please? Uh huh. And they're also going to be at the end of our night. So we've got the National Credit Counseling Tuesday Night Bar. Triple A. Uh huh. Triple A is the credit counselor who is a a reputable credit counseling agency in Utah, and they're about second east and second south downtown, where the where the post office is. And they're called Triple A. They're credit counseling. And those are going to be the people who are going to be able to give you the best advice based on your specific details because they're going to be the experts for you. Okay? That's what I wanted you to. So I just wanted to make sure that we address that from last week. To learn more or to find a class, visit slclibrary.org slash smartinvesting.